Timothy chapter 2, the book of 1 Timothy in chapter 2. Today I want us to consider the, the question, what should we do for our nation? Um, well, you know, some people would say, well, what can we do? You know, looking at kind of where we are, uh, what can we do? Well, I, I want us to kind of go beyond that uh, kind of reasoning this morning. There's a lot we can do and there's a lot we should do. Uh, for our nation today. Paul deals with this as he's writing to a young preacher, uh, preparing him for the ministry and, and what to teach and uh, putting the instruction before God's people. But notice he says here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Well, you know, here we are once again this time of year where we are preparing to celebrate uh, the 4th of July, probably one of the uh, most celebrated holidays that we have uh, in our country is the 4th of July. It's a day we call Independence Day. Uh, you know, it's a day we became a free nation uh, under God, and, and, and so it's a great, great time uh, for us to celebrate. I don't know about you, but in, a, in America, a great place to live. Let's just be honest. Let's put away... I know, troubles and trials and problems, I get that. We'll get to some of that in a moment. But other than all of that, I, folks, I'm telling you, it, it's a great place to live. We know it's not a perfect place, uh, but I can assure you today it's better than most other nations that are in our world today. Uh, most other nations wish they even, you know, where we were uh, in our country. And so America is, is just a great place. Uh, America is also a crazy place. Uh, you know, someone wrote, and I, I don't know who wrote this. I found this here a while back and it was an article and uh, I'm not going to read all of it but just some things I thought would kind of set the stage for our message today and it's entitled Only in America uh, Only in America and, and what, what it says is true and I'm sure you'll agree it says only in America can pizza get to your house faster than an ambulance uh, you know I, I'm telling you that's just where we live y'all we're just we live in a crazy place only in America are there handicapped parking places in front of a skating room you know, when you really consider that, think about that, why? I mean, only in America do drugstores make the sick walk all the way to the back of the store to get their prescription, while healthy people can buy suntan lotion up front. Amen? That's quite an argument that we could put out. Only in America do we buy hot dogs and packages of tin and buns and packages of eight. And y'all, I'll be honest with you, I ain't never figured that one out. Um, we could include, only in America could you eat a double cheeseburger and fries and drink a Diet Coke. Amen? Say amen. So, uh, America's a crazy place. It really is. But I still believe that America is the greatest nation in the world. I believe it with all of my heart. I, I feel blessed by God to have been born and raised in the United States of America. I do. But folks, we also understand today that America's in trouble. America is in trouble and when I say trouble, I mean trouble on all sides. Politically, morally, ethically, you name it, we're in trouble as a nation. And so what can we do for America? What should we do for our great country in which we live? I want to bring a few things to your attention this morning. And we just read them here uh, and, and, and what Paul is instructing young Timothy uh, do you got to understand when you come to first and second Timothy you're coming to the end of Paul's life and he knew he was going to die he knew that was going to be quick and so this was some of his last words to a young protege uh, in the ministry and these were some of the he was just pouring out his heart to him before he faced death and what he tells us in our text today is just phenomenal and it's something that we should do every single day of our life what can we do what should we do for our great country today well first of all we should pray diligently for our country. Pray diligently for our country. Notice how he begins this. He says, I exhort, 
therefore. You'll find that word several times throughout Paul's writing. He'll say, I exhort you, therefore. And when, when you see that word, basically it's a word to draw your attention, to put all focus on what's about to be said. In other words, it, it's kind of like today what we would do, we would, we would put the word out there, then we'd put about five or six uh, exclamation points behind it. In other words, I exhort you. This is important. This is critical as to where we are today. I exhort, therefore, but watch this. He says, first of all, not, not last, not, not somewhere down the list. He says, but Timothy, I want you to understand that what I'm about to tell you is something that you should do and you should do before anything else. First of all, and he uses several words to describe praying. He says, supplication, prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. So what should we do for America? Well, well think about what Paul is, is saying. Here. Well, what should be the first thing that comes out of our mouth for our country? Y'all, we've got to understand that the groundwork for the freedom that we enjoy today has been laid over the past 247 years in our country. As a matter of fact, America is 247 years old. And compared to other nations out there, y'all, that is relatively young. America really is a, a young nation. But, but we enjoy our freedom today. Why? Because of what our founding fathers and forefathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and sons and daughters have, have done to preserve our freedom. Oh, we love the word freedom. We love the word liberty. And we use it quite often, but please understand today, our freedom didn't come cheap. There is a price that is attached to the freedom that you get to enjoy today. I'll tell you what, this coming next week, when you're gathered around the barbecue grill and, and all of that, and, and I mean, it's the hot dogs and the hamburgers and everything else that's going with it, and, and family time and all of that, you ought to bow your head and thank God for the freedom you have to assemble like that. Y'all, what we're doing today, we ought to thank God for the freedom that we still have to come to God's house and assemble together and worship Him in spirit and in truth. We enjoy our freedom today, but that freedom didn't come cheap. Our patriots fought and died to give us our freedom of religion. Listen carefully what I said, freedom of religion. You see, there are those today who are still trying to tell us that the intent, that the intention of our founding fathers was to give us freedom from religion. Folks, there's a major difference in freedom of religion and freedom from religion. And if you'll go back, and if anybody would just go back and study history, you would be amazed at how our country was. It will rock you to the core. Y'all, I'm going to tell you something. God, will, you can see the hand of God in the formation of our country today. It's all over our country. There's a big difference between freedom of and freedom from. Now, let me ask this question this morning, right now, right where we are. Are we a Christian nation today? Some would look at that and say, mm. and others would look at that and say, mm. you know, Probably not. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to say that there aren't fragments of Christianity in our nation today. I'm not going to say that there, there are certain places where you can go, like, like even in the Bible Belt, or where we are, the very buckle of the Bible Belt. You're right. Well, there's a church on every corner. and, and all. I'm not saying there aren't places like that uh, in the world today, but, but our nation as a whole, are we a Christian nation? Well, let me ask this question. Was this nation founded on Christian principles? And the answer to that's absolutely, y'all. I, I mean, no argument. Absolutely. Do you realize that the first settlers of America came here to express their religious faith? For freedom of worship. Freedom of worship. You see, the pilgrims who, who came to Plymouth Rock on the Mayflower, they, they, they wrote what was called the Mayflower Compact in 1620. And if you'll go back and study that in American history, I want you to listen to what they said. They said, in the name of God, having undertaken for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith, 
do solemnly and mutually in the presence of God covenant and combine ourselves together. That's what the Mayflower Compact Act literally says. 23 years later, the New England uh, Confederation was written. And I want you to listen to what the founders wrote. They says, whereas we all came into these parts with one and the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel in purity and peace. That's why we came. That was the whole intention. Now, what do we have today? Unfortunately, what do our young people see today? What, what is it all that they hear? Y'all, there's a group of people in our world today trying to eliminate, trying to exterminate not only the Word of God from public view, but also to obliterate the very idea and concept of God. That's where we are. When the First Continental Congress met, and we're debating about how the Declaration of Independence should be written. A man that you may be familiar with, Benjamin Franklin, stood up. Here's what he said. He said, gentlemen, if it's true that not one single petal from any flower falls to the ground without escaping God's attention, will the distress of this nation go unheeded? He said, let us therefore determine to seek his and do you know what happened shortly before the Declaration of Independence was signed? After he said that, 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence went to their knees and they began to pray and seek God's wisdom. And the result of that was the Declaration of Independence. Can you imagine what would happen today in our Congress and in our Supreme Court? They would hit their knees before a session and pray to Almighty God for wisdom. Y'all, I, I'm telling you, it is amazing. And that is exactly what Paul is saying here. He says, you got to understand, you got to understand the connection. He says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, most importantly, first of all, pray. Supplications, prayers, intercessions. These, these are words that, 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 that kind of lay out what he uses the word prayer. That's talking about general praying. But when he says supplications and intercessions, he's talking about specific. He's talking about getting serious with God. Have you ever supplicated in your life when you prayed to God? I mean, there was a, a certain situation in your life that just dominated your mind, dominated your heart. You can't think about nothing else, wh whether it was someone who was sick or someone who was dying or, or whether it was a medical procedure or whatever it may be at that particular time in your life. And, and that, that was your whole focus. And you went to God supplicating, interceding for that specific thing. Oh, friend, if we got that serious, about America? Hmm. I just wonder if we'd see a change. I just wonder if there'd be a difference. Um, you see, our founding fathers were committed to not only obtaining freedom for future generations, but they were committed to Christian principles. You can't deny this. Listen to what a few of them had to say. John Quincy Adams. If you know John Quincy Adams, he was the second president of the United States. And he was speaking about the Declaration of Independence. Here's what he said. He said, from the time of the Declaration of Independence, the American people were bound by the laws of God. And the laws of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which they all acknowledge as the root of their conduct. We all came together to obey the word of God. That's what he said. We, that's what it was about. We all came together to obey the word of God. George Washington, in, in his farewell address, you remember George Washington, first president of the United States, here's what he said. He says, do not let anyone claim tribute of American patriotism if they even attempt to remove religion You can't even claim American patriotism if you try to take religion away from politics. Patrick Henry, boy, here's what Patrick Henry said. He said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation 
was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Patrick Henry said. You see, these men and hundreds more, that they paid a price to, to give us a nation that was built upon the principles of God and the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the foundation has already been laid. Can we do any less than to pray for America? You see, you see, that's what Paul's telling Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, look, he says, the foundation's already been laid. Jesus is the foundation. Right? He's the perfect found, he's the solid foundation. It's already been laid. And, 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 and he says, you, you know, if you go back in Corinthians earlier, what we talked about, Paul talks about, you know, who was Apollos, you know, who is Paul, who is Cephas, who is all these guys God used. Even in, 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 in to, to, to lay the foundation, he says, now it's your turn, Timothy. It's your turn to take the gavel. It, it, it's your turn to, you know, to, to take it and run with it. The foundation's already been laid. Well, I, I was thinking about this praying for our country. It seems like the most minute thing we can do, right? Sounds simple, doesn't it? Pray for our country. Folks, can I tell you this morning what our country needs? is the prayers of God's people. Now, I'm going to tell you where I'm at many times and see if you can relate. <laughs> if, if, if I had a scale, just an old-fashioned scale, and on that scale, on this side, was me praying for my country, interceding, supplicating. And on the other side of the scale was me complaining about my I just wonder how the scales would break. Do you ever find yourself complaining more than praying? Does it say anywhere in the scripture to complain about your country? Or does it over and over and over again say, pray? You want to know what changes things? You see, one reason why that escapes our mind, y'all, we don't realize we've forgotten the power of prayer. The most powerful thing in the world is a praying Christian. You listen to me. Well, I'll go a little further. Even more powerful than that is a praying church. When we all come together with one common goal, and that is to pray. Amazing. Y'all, even in my short lifetime, I, I have seen God do amazing things when God's people get serious. Why do you think that seven, Second Chronicles 7, 14 is there? If my people, not the world, and we look at it and we say, oh, I'll tell you what, if government would do this, folks, government ain't going to do it. Oh, if they would just do this, and if they would just do this, God says, if you would do this, you see a difference. Prayer. You say, Brother Vine, how effective is that? Well, <laughs> it's most effective. Uh, put this verse down. James 5.16 says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, it carries much weight. It's heavy. The, 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 the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person carries much weight with God. And God uses prayer. God works through prayer. He answers prayer. He moves through the prayers of His people. Don't be one of these that says, oh, well, America's too far gone. There ain't nothing. You can, they say, well, all laws don't come now. The judgment of God upon our Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. There's always a possibility if we do what God says. You, I don't care where you are. You, you go back in the Bible and you read about heathenistic, pagan, ungodly government. God was just able to work through and in. It, it's amazing how God does it. Can I show you a verse of Scripture that ought to bless your heart? You may not know it by heart, but I hopefully after today you will. Look at Proverbs 21 real quick. We'll move to the second point. Proverbs and verse tw uh, chapter 21. And I want you to, to, to look at this verse of Scripture in the light of praying for America. Okay? Proverbs chapter 21 
And by the way, this 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 verse, this book was written by a very wise man. <laughs> a man by the name of Solomon. Do you remember? And I want you to listen to what he tells his son. Proverbs 21 and verse 1. Now listen carefully. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Did you hear what he just said? The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And just like the rivers of water, God can turn it whithersoever he will. Manipulate it, turn it, massage it, whatever. He's God. Now, we don't have kings today, but you understand our leaders, our government, those that are in authority, what he's saying, understand this, that they're in the hands of the Lord. And just like the rivers of water, God can turn that heart, turn that decision. You say, why should I pray for America? I mean, it look, hey, I'll tell you, because number one, God says so. And, and, and argue with him. Number two, of the difference that it will make, you got to understand, all these people who think they're God and think they're in control, they're not in control. God's in control. Their heart is in His hands, and He can turn it however He wants to turn it. That's why you all pray. That's what prayer does. That's what God works through, is, is the prayers of God's people. So what should we do for America? We should pray diligently. Secondly, we should live righteously. Go back to our text. And notice what he says in verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And he says, here's, how, here's who we ought to pray for, for kings and for all that are in authority. Now what's the purpose of that? Keep reading. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. There it is. What can I do for America? What should I do for our nation today? pray diligently first of all because what's that going to lead he said that's going to lead me to live a quiet and peaceable life you know a lot of people are looking for that today aren't they i just want peace i just want to live a quiet life well he isn't that amazing to god that god tells you how you want to lead a peaceful life you want to live a, a, a quiet or peaceable life you know what he says pray What? Yeah, pray. Not worry. Pray. Put it in the hands of the one who can do something about it. That's what he's talking about. And when I do that to the best of my ability, that frees me up from worry and anxiety. Because I'm going to be honest with you today, what we worry and complain, we can't do nothing about anyway. Right? Y'all, that don't make sense. Why worry about something and inflict yourself over things you can't do anything about anyway. But I'm so glad I know the one who can. You know what I mean? And I can approach his throne of grace, and I can go to him 24-7, noon, it don't matter. He's there. He's there. And he can do something about the situation. And I can put my worries and my anxieties and my problems and my trials and everything that's bad that's going on. I can, that's why, I, hey, listen folks, that's why the Bible, that's why Jesus said, come unto me. Come unto me. All ye that are weary, heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. And now notice how Paul picks up on that. He's saying, if you'll pray, God will lead you to a peaceful life. Isn't that amazing? I just want peace. Pray, brother. I just want peace. Pray, sister. Pray. Pray, pray. But notice what he says here. That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life. Watch this. In all godliness and honesty. What he's talking about here is your lifestyle. You see, when I pray and I, and I put all these things that I can't do anything about myself... But when I put it in the hands of God, then that frees me up to be able to live a life that pleases God. I can do what God wants me to do. I can try to live a, a righteous life before Him. Folks, if we want to change the way America's headed, 
We need to live our lives in all godliness and honesty. That's what he's saying. Be the light. Let there be something in your life that people can see that will draw them to the Father. Isn't that amazing Jesus dealt with that? Something along the line of let your light so shine before men that others may see your good work and what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5.16 Isn't that amazing how all this works together? You say, well, how can I live in all godliness and honesty? How do I do this? By living according to the standard in, of God's word. That's why. That's how. By the way, do you realize that the very framework of our nation's government was patterned after the Bible? Boy, that's a shock to some. Y'all, the very framework of our government was patterned after the Bible. Do you realize today we have three branches of government? Do y'all know what that is? Executive, legislative, and judicial. You want to know where that comes from? The Bible. Oh, really? Really? Show me. I'm glad you asked. Look at Isaiah 33. Turn back to the book of Isaiah chapter 33. Y'all, when you do his, when you when you study history, you'll find out exactly that God's word was used in everything. It was all about God. It was all about his word. Boy, how our our nation needs a lesson in this today. Think about this. Isaiah 33. You, you ought to circle this verse. Isaiah chapter 33. Look at verse 22. Read it carefully. It says, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Go back and study the formation of our country, and you'll see how the forefathers used that verse of Scripture, which is basically summarizing who God is. God is our, he's our judge, he's our lawgiver, he's our king. Judge is what? The judicial branch. Lawgiver is what? Legislative. King is the executive. And each branch of government comes from an attribute of God. Wow. Now, the, the knuckleheads up there today, I don't think any of them probably understand that. They want to brag about their position and who they are and vote themselves in a raise and do all that good stuff. We'll talk about all that later. But what I'm saying, that's another sermon. I'm not here today to tell you how bad things are. You know how bad things are. But boy, if they only realize, like I told them in Sunday school today, do you know there is a statue of Moses with the law of God in his hand that faces the Speaker of the House every time he speaks? Where'd that come from, y'all? Come from founding fathers. You talking about intimidating? That's to stand up there before Congress, looking out there and seeing two tablets of stone with God's word on it. That's how you ought to judge. That, that's what government, y'all, that's how government was founded, based upon the principles of the word of God. And yet we want to kick God out of everything. No, friend, when you go back and study, it was all about God to put everything together. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Our founding fathers looked to the word of God to organize the government of our nation. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. They laid the foundation. Guess what? You and I are to build on it. We're to build on it. Now, folks, I realize our nation has strayed away from God's word. I know that. And, and, and I understand the original intent of our founding fathers. <laughs> Boy, if they could see what was going on today. Many of our leaders are trying to take not only God out of our nation, but the very mention of his name to remove him totally. I know on a personal level, individually, single-handedly, there's not a lot I can do about the movement today to eliminate God. But folks, there is something we can do to keep sin from dishonoring God, his name. The Bible says, Proverbs 14, 34, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to 
Righteousness is what exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach. By the way, that verse, Proverbs 14, 34, is right over, right over uh, in the town hall there in Los Angeles, California. Uh, they don't, apparently don't read it, but it's there. Sin has disgraced our nation. Sin has disgraced God. But y'all, we can live a life in all godliness and honesty. Just because most people are doing it wrong doesn't mean you have to. Do you agree? Just because a lot of them are not getting it right doesn't mean that's you. Just because they're doing it. I mean, how many times have you had this argument with kids? Well, everybody's doing it. Well, number one, number one, no, everybody's not doing it. That, that, where that thing ever come up? Well, I guess maybe I used it. I don't know. But anyway, uh, you know, that, that's a generational phrase. But number one, everybody's not doing it. And by the way, just because they are, don't mean you ought to. Right? If everybody jumped off a building, would you go follow them and do it? No. My goodness alive. Listen, he, he's saying that, that, that you and I, we can change things, y'all. Sin has disgraced our nation, but we can live a life of godliness and honesty. What can we do for America? Live a righteous life. Live a righteous life. That's what he's telling us. And then lastly, we ought to share Christ faithfully. Because notice in our text in 1 Timothy chapter 2, notice what he says in verse 3. Oh, by the way, praying and, and living a righteous life. Look what he says in verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. You know, a lot of times we struggle with what God's will is for my life. I love it when the Bible tells you this is God's will. And by the way, it's good. <laughs> and it's acceptable. And that's what he wants you to do. Right? But look at verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of what should we do for our great country? We should share Christ faithfully. The unbelie unbelieving world today is constantly sh shouting its message. And you know what? Our leaders are listening. Our leaders are listening. I mean, anything from gay marriage to lesbian and transgenderism and all that. And, you, and what gets me, there's such a small minority in our country. And I'm, I'm not, listen, number one, they need Jesus. Amen? They need a good dose of salvation. Because I'm going to tell you something, friend. When you get Jesus, he changes everything. He'll change your perception on who you are. Oh, by the way, young people, can I just say something this morning? God's already designed your gender. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. And by the way, he ain't confused. Amen? Uh, a lot of people today might be, but he's not. God's not. And, and, and so listen, what he's given you, that's, that's who you are. That's who you, I don't care how you try to change it. It's still who you are. What, what a lot of these people don't understand. 50 years from now, when they're dead and gone, their body's in the ground. If they come back and resume that body 50 years later, do you realize they did a DNA test on that body? Do you know it'll go right back to what's on their birth certificate? I don't care what kind of operation they've had. It'll go right back to their birth system. You can't deny your DNA. Be who God created you to be. Amen? And, and, and so, listen, but, 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 but all of the abortionists are speaking out, and our leaders are listening. The liberals are speaking out. Our leaders are listening. But you've got to understand something. You look at the world today through our liberal media, you think, well, oh, my goodness, that's, that's where the whole world's turning. That's where we are. Friend, that is a small segment who we are as a nation. The sad truth is Christians in America are the majority. Still. Majority. But we're doing very little to speak out as a witness for Christ. We get intimidated by the ACLU and other groups that are trying to tell us, you know, separation of church and state and all this kind of mess. Listen, well, a lot of times you and I are, con are content to sit in our homes and, and shake our heads at the direction, the way our country is headed. But we do very little outside to be a witness for you. That's where the battle is, y'all, out here. 
We come in here to do what? We come in here to get our batteries charged. We come in here to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Why? Why? Why do we do that weekly? Oh, I do that every... Let me tell you why. To go right back out there and fight that battle again. You see, that's where the battle's at. The battle's on the outside of these doors. God expects us to use the freedom that our founding fathers made possible to be a witness for Christ in the sinful world in which you live. Can I tell you something? Don't you let an ungodly, pagan, hedonistic nation intimidate you about your faith. Don't, don't allow that to happen. Here's what the Bible says in Psalms 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. When our nation, including those who call themselves Christians, cease to look to God, then we cease in being blessed by God. Our forefathers claimed this nation for God. It's our job today to reclaim it. That's what our job is, reclaim it <laughs> for God. What do I do, Brother Brian? Pray for America. Pray for our leaders, y'all. Pray that God would save them. Pray that they would hear a clear representation, a clear presentation of the gospel. Pray that God would put godly leaders, people around them. Pray that God would intervene. Live a righteous life. Stand on the principle and the value of the Word of God. That's what he says. If God stands there, you stand there. Right? Can I get amen? Shine forth the light of Christ. Let others see Jesus in you. Somebody ought to write a song. Let others see Jesus in you. Folks, I want to tell you today, the only hope that America has is Jesus. That's our hope. That's the only hope. So, that should be, first and foremost, what? Pray. Pray. Oh, the power of prayer. Do you, let, me, let me show you how powerful prayer is. Do you realize that if you pray to God and you ask Him to forgive your sins, and to be your Savior, that God, based upon the authority of the Word of God, will change your whole eternity. Based upon a simple prayer of faith, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Boy, if a group of people like this got really concerned about where we are as a nation, we got on our knees every day, first thing out of the, first thing out of the, Pray, oh God, help our nation. Help our leaders. I just wonder if you see a difference. I tell you, God's challenged me through this, and if nobody else, myself, to pray more and make it a priority. Prayer is not something you tack on at the end of a service. Prayer is something you do first. It's a first priority because it's so powerful. Because He's God. That's why we do this. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that, that you're just a powerful, all-wise, all-knowing God. Lord, we, as a nation, have drifted far away from where you want us to be. I can't imagine what you may feel when you just look at all the filth and sin of this world. Your patience. Your long suffering. What your son went through in order to die for our sins. And Father, today we just, I know personally, I ask you to forgive my sins. We ask you to heal our land. And we ask you to use us to do it. Help us. Be a light for Jesus. Father, we'll just give you all glory. We sing.